Good morning. I may have told this joke before, so if you've heard it, don't stop me. A gentleman found out that he was going to be passing away. He had a disease. There was no cure. He was very wealthy. He took all of his earthly belongings. Thank you, Danny. He took all of his earthly belongings, sold them, took all that money, and bought gold bricks. And people asked him, why are you doing this? And he said, because I'm about to die, and this way I can take it with me. He left very specific instructions to be buried with these gold bricks, thinking he would be able to take it with him. Now, you're not going to believe this, but it worked. As the story goes, this is a true story. He's walking up to the pearly gates with his bag of gold bricks. He gets to the gate, and the angel is there at the gate, and, and the angel's going, wow, I've never seen anyone get here with anything before. What does this guy have? So he gets up to the gate, and the angel can't help but ask, sir, I must know what's in the bag. So the man opened up the bag, and the angel looked in and went, oh, you brought pavement. <laughs> now, for those of you who are still wondering, do we all get it? In heaven, the streets are paved with gold. Okay. Now, that story is not really theologically correct. Um, and in fact, if he had gotten there with that gold, do you know that it would have been rejected anyway? Do you know why? Well, for one thing, in heaven, the streets aren't paved with gold. They are gold. For another thing, the streets of gold in heaven are clear, like glass. Well, that doesn't compute. There's, there's no such thing as clear gold. Well, we haven't been able to achieve a refining process on this earth that would result in clear gold, but God did. So those, those bricks wouldn't have done anything anyway. Why do I bring that up? Because next week, that's what we're getting into. We're getting into the physical description of the new Jerusalem. And oftentimes we get heaven confused with the new Jerusalem. Oftentimes we get things that we think are going to be happening in heaven, but they're actually going to be happening on this earth. And then did you know that there's going to be a time when this earth is gone and there will be a brand new earth? interesting. A lot of our, um, a lot of the, the visions we have in our, in our mind or what we think is going to happen when we die and go to heaven um, are not exactly accurate. There, there's, um, there's lots of things that we're going to be finding out about um, that we have to look forward to. So, but today we're going to cover a lot of ground because I want to get to that. Last week, uh, we talked about the um, Battle of Armageddon, and before we recap and get into this week's, can I have that first slide, please, Ron? Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near, even when it doesn't seem like it. It is even when it doesn't seem like it. Ha you know, it could be another year. It could be another day. It could be 10 more years. Do you know it could be 5,000 more years before the end? 
but in our perspective, if we just look at the span of our lifetime, because once our lifetime is over, that's it. The end is near. The time is near. In other words, the time that we have to serve God, to do the things that he's called us to do, is short. The end of our life is near. And that's a way to, um, to keep into perspective that we can, uh, with anticipation, look forward to these things. So, last week, uh, the Battle of Armageddon. All these, these um, uh, armies show up, and Jesus shows up, and that's it. It's over. Um, in, so, I just want to start in verse 17. This is... Uh, there's two suppers talked about in chapter 19. We talked a couple weeks ago about the marriage supper of the Lamb. We could be present for that supper, or we're going to hear about a supper right here that we can be present for. Um, the marriage supper of the Lamb, we eat the supper. This supper that we're going to talk about right here, um, we are the supper. So we don't want to be a part of this one, but let's read about what, it, what it's going to be like. Verse 17, then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both great and small. These are those who are defeated in the battle of Armageddon. And we could spend all kinds of time on this, but I really want to cover some ground today. Verse 19, And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathering together to make war against him who sat on the horse and, his, and against his army. That, of course, is Jesus. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. All the birds were filled with their flesh. So, this is the end of the battle of, uh, of Armageddon. Very gruesome scene. We don't need to get into it and, and dive into it at this time. But the fact that that battle took place, that Jesus, with us, coming with him, took care of his business, wiped out at the end of the tribulation period all those unbelieving people, people that rebelled against God, People that literally wanted to kill God so that they could go on their own, their own way. That has been taken care of, and now, verse 20, I'm sorry, chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now, the the Antichrist and the false prophet have just been cast into the lake of fire where, where they will be tormented forever and ever. Now, this angel comes down with key to the bottomless pit with a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon. Who is the dragon? That serpent of old. Who is that? Who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. Now, this is the ushering in of the millennium, known as the millennium. It's, I think it's Latin, made up of two words, a thousand years, milli annum. It's the millennium. It's the thousand-year reign of Christ that kicks off right here. This is a period of time on this earth, Satan is locked up in the bottomless pit 
and we'll read just in a second, he's no longer able to have any influence over any people. This brings in a whole nother load of questions, okay? He's no longer to, able to have any influence over any people for a thousand years, okay? Now, what has happened? As we go back in this tribulation period, at some point during the tribulation period, the church has been raptured. The church has been taken up to heaven. At some point, whatever, you, whatever point works for you, doesn't matter. The church has been taken up to heaven. Who does that leave? That leaves people on the earth. Some of them will see the signs of the times. They'll see the things that God is doing, all of these things that we've read about all through this book. And they will go, ah, God's putting his final days into action. There will be people who are completely familiar with the book of Revelation who, may not, who, who are not believers. Lots of people study this book. Lots of atheists study this book. People who don't care about being a follower of Jesus know a lot about this book. And they will see the things that are happening and they'll go, oh, it is true. He really is there. This really is happening. I'm going to get on I'm going to get on his side. There will be people in the tribulation who become followers of Jesus when they see the things that are going on. There's the Jewish remnant that we read about, the 144,000 who remain faithful during the tribulation. There's the, the two witnesses. Remember way back when we heard about the two witnesses that God sent to preach to people during the tribulation? They will be successful. There will be people who will be converted. These people are still on the earth. These people are not part of the rapture when God comes to rapture the church to heaven. These people are still on the earth. People that are living who became believers during the tribulation. So, what about all the people who were killed in the Battle of Armageddon? What happens to them? What happens to them? We're going to find out that at the end of this thousand-year reign of Jesus... And what this is, is this is Jesus coming to this earth, being in charge, and reigning over this earth for a thousand years with no satanic influence on this earth at all. Okay? That's going to be good. Lots of things are going to be changing, um, even to the point of people living longer, looking more like it did in the Garden of Eden before Satan entered the world. So, Jesus is reigning. All these unbelievers that were killed in the Battle of Armageddon, they're just kind of um, hanging out somewhere. I don't know where. This, some people would call it soul sleep. I don't know if, that's, if that is a um, theologically accurate statement or not. Um, put it this way. We just don't hear about them again for a thousand years. Whatever God decided to do with them in that time, totally up to him. So this is the picture that we're going into. So verse 3, and he cast him into the bottomless pit, that is the angel. And you know what? God didn't even have to do it. Jesus didn't even have to do it. He just said it, said, sent an angel. Hey, go get Satan and throw him in the hole. Would you please? Go get Satan, throw him in the hole. A lot of times we think that God and Satan are counterparts, and they are not. They are not. God or Satan is, is nothing more than a created being created by God who has absolutely no power and no control unless God lets him have that power or control. Okay? So, all God has to do is tell an angel, hey, um, I even heard 
one pastor say that, uh, that uh, wouldn't it be cool if, because there's hierarchies of angels, like in the military, there's, there's, there's a chain of command, sort of, with the angels in heaven. And, and this guy said, wouldn't it be funny if the angel at the very bottom lowest end of the totem pole, the, the lowest ranking angel in heaven, was the one who God said, hey, go get Satan and throw him in the hole. And he just did it. Because that's the power that God has over him. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him, listen to this, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. Okay, but listen to this. But after the thousand years, he must be released for a little while. Satan is bound for a thousand years. After the thousand years, he must be released for a little while. So apparently, after the thousand years are up, and Jesus has been reigning on the earth, and there has been no satanic um, um, activity at all on the earth to, to, to lure people to rebel. Apparently, he's going to get one last shot to try to get his rebellious lot at the end of that thousand years. And it sounds like he does have some success, if you can imagine that. If you can imagine that. Um, I wonder if God does this just to show us that because of original sin entering into the human race, because sin entered the world, even if we go a thousand years with no influence of sin, with Jesus himself reigning over the earth, that Satan can show up and still have an effect and still cause people to rebel. I believe that's why we're told we will be getting new bodies, a new heaven, a new earth, so that that will absolutely never happen again. Um, once Satan is let go and he, has, he does his thing, there is one last, one last battle, but we'll see that when that battle takes place, all that happens is God sends fire, devours them all, poof, it's over. Nothing to it. From that point on, we will never, ever, ever again have to deal with Satan's influence. We will never, ever again have to worry, what if something happens in the future? What if something causes me to rebel against God? What if I get stupid? What if I'm the only one in heaven and I get stupid and I have a rebellious thought? What's going to happen to me? Nothing, because you won't. You won't. It would be absolute perfection, absolute purity, absolute holiness, and there will be absolutely nothing to distract us from service and worship to our God. That's going to be... You imagine how light you're going to feel? You ever have something bothering you, Cynthia? Kind of bothering you? And then all of a sudden you find out, oh, that thing that was bothering me, it doesn't exist. Ah. <sighs> Isn't that a relaxing feeling? Can you imagine spending eternity completely relaxed? Completely at peace? Completely filled with joy? Take the best day of your life that you can remember, and that is maybe just a glimpse of what eternity is going to be like without interruption. Okay. Verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Now, who are they talking about? Who's John talking about here? Now I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Well, this may give us a clue. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, 
who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So, there's a teaching that, that when Jesus comes back to the earth to reign for a thousand years, that we will come with him. And maybe we will. Maybe this is just a, a select group of people. Maybe it's him and the martyrs who get to reign. I don't know, but I do know this. There was a parable where Jesus talked about a, um, a master taking a trip, and he entrusted three of his servants with some of his stuff. You remember that? I'll give you ten talents. I'll give you five talents. I'll give you... And when he came back, they, they, get, they showed him what, what they did with his stuff while he was gone. And... It never really sunk in with me that in one of those parables to, to his good servants, his reply was, well done, good and faithful servant. I will make you a ruler over ten cities. <clears throat> and I never really understood that. But if we look at that in the context of ruling and reigning with Jesus on the new earth, I wonder if there's a connection there. I wonder if there is. Do you? Things to think about. Things to take to heart. Verse 5, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. That's what I was talking about. All those who died unbelieving and who died at that battle of Armageddon, they did not live again until the thousand years were finished. And this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, those dead being not heard of for a thousand years is not the reference to um, the first resurrection, I believe the first resurrection is a reference to those sitting on thrones, ruling and reigning uh, with Jesus, those that lost their lives in the tribulation. Just a little bit more and we'll be done. Verse 7, now when the thousand years had expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to devour the nations which are in the four corners of the, of the earth. Now, how could there be that many people? Well, as many people as are living and are believing through the tribulation who are populating the earth at the time, give them a thousand years, they're going to fill it up. Same thing happened with Adam. Multiply and, and fill the earth. Same thing happened with Noah. With his kids, multiply and fill the earth. Same thing will happen here. The earth will be populated. There will be a lot of people. Now when the thousand years... Verse 7, go to his prison. Verse 8, and will go out to deceive the nations which are on the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog. There's lots of debate as to what those places are. It's okay. doesn't matter for how we're supposed to live today. Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. Um, they went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Now this is... I believe, a reference to all this rebellious lot. Once Satan is released, he goes around, he gets as many as he can. They go to Jerusalem to, to kill everybody there because everybody there is a believer. And that is where Jesus is ruling and reigning from. Why do I always lose my place? They went up to the breath of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and fire came down from God of heaven and devoured them. Poof, that's it. That one's over. Hardly even worth talking about. The devil who deceived them now was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. There is a teaching out there. You may have heard it. 
it goes by the name, um, is it annihilationism? Is that a word, Ron, annihilationism? Maybe that's not the name of the teaching. It teaches the, the doctrine of annihilation. And what that is, is if you're an unbeliever and you get separated from God and your future is to be tormented in the lake of fire forever and ever, they say actually what happens is you just end up ceasing to exist. Okay, now you know we've been, been told all our lives, you're going to spend eternity somewhere. It's going to be in heaven or it's going to be in hell. Well, this teaching has come along and said, no, 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 that's not true. You're either going to be in heaven or you're going to cease to exist. What does that do? What does that do? Um, is that if, okay, let me be honest and tell you what it would do to me. <laughs> I can make this choice serve Jesus, it's harder. Um, if I'm coming from an unsaved perspective, I would say it's not going to be as much fun because me in an unsaved state enjoys sin. So I can leave my life of sin, serve this holy God who will probably want me to do things that I don't want to do, or I can live this life the way I want, and here's the only difference. Either I spend eternity in heaven, or I just cease to exist. Now, if we just cease to exist, or if I don't exist, do I care if I'm in heaven or not? No, because I don't exist. I, I'm, I'm erased from, from all consciousness. I think that that is a teaching that causes some people to go, oh, well, if I'm just not going to exist anymore, I'll just do what I want. And once I don't exist anymore, it really won't matter because I will not exist anymore. So don't, don't fall for that line of teaching. If you hear that line of teaching, let your radar go up. And the reason I say that is because after Satan is bound for a thousand years, and he comes out, he does his things, he's devoured by God, and he's thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. So after a thousand years, the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet have been um, in the lake of fire, being tormented day and night for a thousand years, they're still there. And I believe that anyone who unfortunately get sentenced to spending eternity in the lake of fire is going to be there for eternity. So we have a great, um, a great and wonderful choice to make. When we deal with people in our lives who are not following Jesus, and we talk about some things out of, the, out of the Bible, they're not going to understand. Because the Bible says that God has veiled, blocked off the gospel to unbelievers so that they cannot understand. As we're dealing with people in this world who are unbelievers, then how are we to share Jesus with them? Do you know one thing that will not be veiled to them, that they will be able to understand, is your story. It's your story. What has happened to you? What has Jesus done for you? And the Bible teaches that once a person becomes a believer and the Holy Spirit comes on them, then their eyes are opened and they're able to understand this book. Just like those two guys walking on the road to Emmaus and this third guy walks up and says, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, what do you mean what are we talking about? Are you new? 
Do you not know the things that have just happened in Jerusalem? How our Messiah was killed? And of course it was Jesus, but they did not recognize him, who, was, who he was walking with. And Jesus, starting with Moses and the prophets, meaning the books of Moses and the prophets, meaning the Bible that they had at that time, it says that Jesus went through the scriptures with them as they walked and pointed out all the scriptural references that had to do with himself. That's a good walk to take, and that's encouragement for us that when we give our lives to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes upon us, Jesus will reveal these things to us. You say, well, he hasn't revealed them to me. I've been reading this thing. It's pretty complicated. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't really make things real easy for us, does he? But they're a lot easier for us than they've been for a lot of other people. It's, uh, it takes a little bit of work takes a little bit of initiative, um, but he will do it through his Holy Spirit. If you want to know, if you dig into this book and you want him to show himself to you, if you want Jesus to show himself to you on the pages of this book, he will do it. He will do it. Um, I think maybe first, sometimes he needs to work on our perspective. Um, a lot of us have been conditioned to see God as a strict lawgiver. He's a strict lawgiver, and here's the laws, and you better follow them. And if you don't, this is what you got coming. Um, but Jesus revealed God through a lens of grace. And if we can go and start looking through this and saying, all right, that's all I'm going to do. I'm going through John or I'm, I'm going through Corinthians or whatever it is. And I'm going to look at this page and I'm going to find something about God's goodness on this page. About his goodness to me. I'm going to find it. And if I read it once and I don't find it, read it again. It's there. Goodness of God is all throughout this book. The grace of God, the, um, the love that Jesus has for us, it's all through here. It's all through here. So, We got through, do you know, we, we covered over a thousand years in the Bible already this morning. Now, next week we'll start up talking about um, all those people that died at the Battle of Armageddon and all unbelievers who have died. We've got just about three or four verses that talks about how they are going to be judged. Okay, they will be judged. We're going to talk about how they are going to be judged. And then, next week, the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven with descriptions, which we haven't really had, measurements, physical measurements, sizes, which we have not really had. Um, it's going to be great. We're going to find out the dimensions of the, the new city, the new Jerusalem. What does it look like? How big is it? What is it made of? It's going to be good. It's going to be good. And then, after that, we'll, we'll have some time just to focus on Jesus' final words. After everything is said and done, what he wants you to know about him. What he wants you to know about him. Blessed is the one who reads aloud and one who hears the words of this prophecy and takes to heart what is written in it.
for the time is near. We've got big blessings coming up in the next few weeks going through this book. So don't miss it. If you have any prayer requests or you have any needs, you can please make them known. Will you stand with me, please? You can please make those known. Raise your hands. Walk up here. Yeah. Oh.